back with all of you. Every summer vacation, I learned a new lesson in forgiveness. Let me paint the picture for you. Four generations in a three-bedroom house. That's all I have to say. <laughs> There's a new baby on a two-hour schedule of feeding and naps that cannot be disrupted. There is a tween in full disgust mode. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's an American mom in English territory trying just to make everyone happy, right? And a husband juggling family time, tending to his aging mom, and still responding to work calls. And then there's an English great-grandmother who is so excited to have everyone there, but just doesn't understand why they have to be so messy all of the time. <laughs> so living across the ocean from our family, we intentionally use our summer vacations to invest in building and renewing these wonderful relationships. It is an investment that has paid off over the years. We have vibrant relationships with grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins and old friends. We love each other. And most of the time, we can laugh. But it's not without tension, and it's not without conflict. And when we can't laugh, we each have like a small closet that we go into and just count slowly to 100 before we come back out again. <laughs> Every year as we drive to the Heathrow Airport to come home, I find myself silently saying a prayer of forgiveness. May we each forgive one another for all the ways that we have driven one another crazy. <laughs> and most importantly, for the ways we may have hurt one another and not known. I know that I am not alone in this, my conversations this summer have been filled with stories of people in conflict with people they love or people that they once loved. The word forgiveness has emerged again and again and again, and as I listen to these conversations, I realize when we say the word forgiveness, we may want to ask one another what we actually mean. Because when we talk about it, we're talking about lots of different things. And here's what I want you to know. Forgiveness is like an onion. It's stinky. <laughs> it makes you want to cry. And it's got lots and lots of layers. And the more you peel, the more layers you find. As I was thinking about this, there are so many people that I want to thank who sat with me in conversation or I sent emails to and they sent emails back to me. And they connected me with something called the Forgiveness Project, started by Anita Roddick, who started the body shop, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And in the Forgiveness Project, they define forgiveness. They say that it's a complex and enigmatic concept. That forgiveness is hard to pin down because it can apply in different ways to different situations. Not everyone experiences it in the same manner. And if we went around the congregation here and asked all of you to tell a story of forgiveness, you would have very different stories and very different meanings. The standard definition for forgiveness is to cease feeling resentment against an offender. To cease feeling resentment. Another way that I've heard forgiveness defined is not allowing an offender to have power over you or your path forward. I want to be very clear that forgiveness is not simply forgetting. Forgive and forget, right? So not it. <laughs> it's a process, a longer term, fluid, and ever-changing process where people work towards healing. And it's not as easy or honestly as magical as those five, maybe six words while those five words are important, vital even, I'm sorry and I forgive you, it's the actual process is much more of a large process. Forgiveness is a choice. You can go through the process of forgiveness and then choose whether or not you actually want to forgive another person. One member took a leap of faith and shared with me the story of her relationship with her abusive husband, a marriage that eventually dissolved. And she wrote, I read the platitudes on forgiveness with a wary heart. I acknowledge the sensible advice that forgiveness is about freeing yourself. And I admire the exceptional few who suffer the unimaginable loss of a loved one to violence. And yet, 
forgive those who wrong them. But there is a small, hard stone in my heart that I will not dislodge. I forgive myself and him for marrying too young. I forgive myself and him for repeating the patterns of relationships we both saw in our families growing up. But I do not forgive his hateful words and his brutal acts. To forgive him, I would require that he ask for forgiveness, that he say he is sorry, and that he cease his despicable behavior. But he does not. And I will not disregard myself. I will not erase myself in the name of forgiveness. For this member, she discovered through a process what she would forgive and what she would not. Often when we use that word of forgiveness, and you could hear it and how she described it, we actually mean reconciling with someone. But forgiveness and reconciliation are actually two different things. Forgiveness can occur without the reconciliation of a relationship. You can forgive someone without ever speaking to them again. As Desmond Tutu says, you can release the relationship rather than renew it. Someone shared with me that after years of inward struggle, they woke up one morning and found that the painful relationship no longer mattered as much and that they felt some space in order to forgive, but they never went back to the relationship. The path toward reconciliation, however, is often described as a journey in two directions, an inward, one, towards self-discovery and reconciliation with personal suffering, and then also an outward one, where you go and talk to the person and work towards reconciliation. But here's what I want to say, and here's what you probably heard in our member's statement. Reconciliation involves accountability. In my family, I was taught that when you say the words, I'm sorry, it means you won't do it again. <laughs> it requires you to change your behavior. And our actions are held accountable to the promise that we make when we say, I'm sorry, to the other person. This is tough work. Lots of times in relationships, you can have insight into another person. You can or even in yourself, you can know that you need to change. You can have understanding. I understand why they did what they did. But behavior change is the third and probably the hardest piece. But it's imperative for reconciliation to occur. Since our presidential election, it's no surprise that there's been a fair amount of tension, you know, in some of our families. Just putting that out there. I'll just say as an aside that when I was in England, our English family said, How's it going over there? <laughs> and I turned to them and said, yeah, how's Brexit going? <laughs> so for many, forgiveness and recon reconciliation really do seem impossible. And during a family gathering last year, Diana Kaiser, a member here, and a progressive Democrat got into a shouting match with her sister Cindy, who is a Republican and a Trump supporter. The subject was on Islamophobia in America. It was incredibly painful for the entire family, everyone who was, who was involved, and it was a red flag that the divisive politics of our country um, had really seriously dented the strength of their relationship. So they could have opted just not to speak about politics. Many of us have. But they chose a different road. First, they tried to understand one another. Diana watched Fox News. Cindy listened to NPR. <laughs> they realized that their worldviews were so different due to the media that they consumed, but also based on where they lived and the communities that they gathered in. And then they changed their behavior. When they talked about politics, instead of immediately reacting and jumping to conclusions or judging the other person, they made a concerted effort to get curious and to ask questions. Then I will tell you, it was not easy. Amazingly, you can actually hear their whole exchange on a podcast called Make America Relate Again. Not only did they do that for one another in their own relationship, but they put it out there for all of us to listen to. And I, I 
couldn't tell you how proud I was of the two of them and how articulate they were. Throughout their interview, you can hear questions from each sister that go beyond just politics, but that get into the humanity of the, of the questions. Questions like, why does it feel like the liberals during the election judge me as a lesser human being for voting Republican? How are people of color being affected by our politics right now? If I walk into a restaurant with an LGBTQ t-shirt, or even having an, a Puerto Rican flag on my t-shirt, do people have the right not to serve me? How are we gonna treat one another when we're on opposing sides? Now I will tell you that I don't think either sister, at least in the interview, said the magic words of I'm sorry, or I forgive you. But forgiveness and reconciliation were possible because they changed their behavior toward one another. And I want to be real honest with you that this is a wonderful example, but all too often, behaviors of offenders do not change, either because they lack the ability to change or because they refuse to see their own culpability. In his book called People of the Lie, M. Scott Peck defines evil as those people who attack others instead of facing their own failures. Because they consider themselves to be above reproach, they must lash out at anyone who calls them to account. They sacrifice others to preserve their self-image of perfection and to avoid spiritual growth. It is possible to forgive such a person, a person of the lie, remembering that forgiveness is ceasing and feeling resentment towards an offender but you do not have to forgive them. But it is impossible to seek reconciliation with them because they cannot own up to their behaviors, let alone change them. This is also true in systems of power. In a recent Huffington Post article, Carol Anderson asked the question, how did America get here? Her answer, forgiveness got us here. She writes, counterintuitive though it might sound, the American penchant for unconditional forgiveness is at the root of our present turmoil. We have tended to forgive those who wage the most sustained, brutal assault in the name of white supremacy without requiring them to repudiate their beliefs or actions in return. We have rationalized that forgiveness, that generosity as moving on and as helping the nation to heal. But misusing forgiveness does neither. Note that she uses, she says we misuse forgiveness. And I want to just take a moment to say we misuse forgiveness so often, and often it's to force victims to let go of the accountability of their yes. offenders, true. right? And that's true in our country as well. She cites one historical example after another where the misuse of unconditional forgiveness prevented the United States from a, powerful Amer from a powerful reconciliation. And by the end of her article, it's like you can actually see Grudgeville, right? And how that story has come true in our own America. And it's gonna take a lot more than five magical words to get to reconciliation. Anderson writes, it's not that forgiveness is wrong, but forgiving those who refuse to own up to and repudiate the belief system that caused such damage allows the destructive power of white supremacy and its advocates to continue to operate with impunity. Forgiveness, she says, is a virtue. The misuse of it is not. So I have to ask you, why does forgiveness, why does reconciliation matter, both in our lives, but also in our nation? And this is where Omid Safi's story speaks to me, because it gets to me to how we are called to live. In the final two hours of life, he says, what we want is to be with the ones we love the most and to tell them that they are loved. This affirms, he says, my faith that what is most basic to our divine nature is love, intimacy, tenderness, and seeking forgiveness. Safi reminds us that relationships, relationships are at the core of the human experience. To love and to be loved, to belong and to offer belonging. And as a covenantal religion, what is central for Unitarian Universalists is relationship. The promises that we make to one another, 
That's why we sang that song, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. But as you noticed how hard it was a little bit to sing that line through, though I've broken my vows a thousand times. Come, yet again, come. We understand that if you are a human being and you are in a relationship, you will at some point break your vow. We've all needed to ask for forgiveness, and we've all needed someone to hold us accountable. That's why I'm in a relationship, because I want to grow. And I actually can't see all of my faults. I need you all to come and tell me, hey, you got this wrong. And when you don't tell me, it's a disservice to me. It stops me from growing. And not only that, it stops our relationship from growing. None of us are perfect. Can you just say that out loud? <laughs> None, None of us are perfect. perfect. I know one, one or two of you are like, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> None of us are immune. We will all hurt someone, both in small ways and in big ways. Because life puts us in such crazy, messed up experiences. And the more times than we wish to admit, our best selves just do not show up. We know that to seek authentic forgiveness and to offer it, to work towards reconciliation, that they are the core disciplines of loving relationships. And instead of waiting until the last two hours of life, Omid Safi tells us to begin now. It is now as it shall be then. So I invite you this week to be a little bit brave. I want you to consider a person to whom you feel the need to say, I'm sorry. What would you say to them? What do you think they would tell you if you just sat and listened? What behaviors would you have to change in order to keep your promise to them? Now, I only invite you to think about it or to journal about it, take a piece of paper out, write about it. Just start there. You don't have to do anything more than that. Who in your life do you need to say I'm sorry to? My friends, Forgiveness is like an onion. It's stinky, it makes you want to cry, and it's got loads of layers. But as Robin so eloquently said, it's worth the risk, because there at the core of it is love. May we in this time and in this sanctuary of care offer one another that gift. Amen.